to today's webinar with TechSite. We are uh, currently at episode seven of our Pioneers in Digital Pathology webinar series. Today's webinar is on digital pathology infrastructure requirements. Where do we start? And we are lucky to have Dr. Orly Arden with us. And Orly Arden is the director of digital pathology operations. Uh, she's an investigator at the Warren Albert Center for Digital and Computational Pathology, and she's an assistant member of the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at Memorial Sloan Kettering Center, uh, Cancer Center. She's also a board member at the DPA, uh, the Digital Pathology Association, and has published uh, a lot on the topics of digital pathology and laboratory in innovation. And her research focuses on the operational aspects of digital technologies and clinical implementation of laboratory automation in general. Um, and she's really interested in process improvements and healthcare uh, economics. She uh, completed uh, BSc and MSc and a PhD in microbiology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She's got an executive MBA from the University of Utah. Her postdoctoral training was in cell biology and virology at the University of Utah. And before joining uh, MSKCC, she headed the development of novel computer assisted diagnostics tools, uh, including the expansion of digital pathology um, collaborative uh, initiatives at ARUP laboratories in Salt Lake City, Utah. So we're very happy to have her. And today uh, we're going to, first of all, just briefly talk about who TechSide is uh, and what digital pathology is. And then uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Arden is going to share with us where to start when you're getting into uh, implementing digital pathology. So very briefly about TechSite. Uh, as a company, we uh, are based uh, on developing the, the human laboratory environment, but we do have other verticals in, in veterinary and environmental, and they have helped us to scale out and uh, use the same technology that we do for other for other areas that, that benefit people. And our offices are located in Utah, but we also have European offices in Luxembourg. We're currently, this number is a bit outdated. We're about at 160 today um, and we're all over. We're a remote first company. And what we do is we use AI to hopefully create a positive impact on the health of humans, animals, and the environment. And so without further ado, I'd like to turn the, the camera over to Dr. Arden, who's going to talk to us about digital pathology infrastructure requirements. Um, great, great. Oh, uh, Dr. Arden, just really quickly, if any of you have any questions, we would encourage you to use the chat, the private chat uh, in your interface, and we will address them at the end of the webinar. Right, right. Thanks, Thanks for the introduction. I hear an echo, and is that okay? Maybe not. That should be okay. Um, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, we're all good. We can okay. hear you loud and clear. Great. So just I have to put this disclaimer on, um, and I want to start with just a quick introduction, really quick about uh, digital pathology because you're on here. And I assume you're here because you're interested in digital pathology, but I always say that digital pathology means different things for different individuals. I like to use the Digital Pathology Association um, um, definition of what's digital pathology. So some people see any digitized slide as uh, digital pathology. Others uh, think of bigger um, um, infrastructure is digital pathology, but it's really up for your interpretation. But the truth is that doesn't matter how you look at it, it's really disrupting the way we do pathology right now. Um, it's offering so many benefits to pathology. Um, some of them are written here. Um, these are some use cases that we like to talk about when we talk about digital pathology. And it's not just in anatomic pathology. Um, we also see benefits um, to use cases in clinical pathology, mainly microbiology, but regardless, anything that requires eyeball for diagnostics, we can use um, digital pathology. Um, so 
I think that one of the things that I would like to emphasize is that there are multiple use cases. Not every institution is going to be interested in all of these use cases. So it's really re good to remember not to compare yourself to any other institution. Um, and I'll constantly remind everybody when I continue this talk that there are just many, many use cases that you should think of when you put together your planning for digital pathology. Um, so this is from a publication that we had that tried to distinguish between the different uh, benefits of digital pathology based on whether they are tangible or intangible. And I think there is lots of excitement right now about the new CPT codes, uh, the increased um, ability to um, review and diagnose and um, lots of thoughts about cost savings and cost avoidance and also the potential of digital pathology to produce images that can be used for AI development and commercialization. We also, in the healthcare business, I always have to remind everyone, digital pathology improves patient care. And there are many reasons why it improves patient care, um, not just the fact that it can expedite the, the time for diagnosis, it improves the accuracy, and it also allows the ability to serve populations that are really underserved. So you don't have to have expert pathologists like we do have in MSK for very rare cancers. You can have um, institutions that can share their images to with other places or use AI tools in order to, to get to an accurate uh, diagnosis. And there are other benefits. Um, some of them are just required for keeping uh, leadership in the field and also for academic productivity for academic uh, medical centers. But the truth is there are lots of benefits and it's now becoming evident that the field is ready for um, getting into digital pathology in order to improve the um, pathology operations. On the other hand, um, there are issues that prevent uh, laboratories from adopting digital pathology. So the field is having a very slow adoption rate. We are seeing more interest now, but it's still um, very slow. And there are lots of uh, cited issues with digital pathology, the fact that it's a new disruptive, disruptive technology, it requires specialized infrastructure that I'll get to in a second. Uh, you also need additional staff that you just don't need when you don't do this digital transformation, and you need to validate your workflows. The biggest one that I, I hear over and over again, it's this paradigm change for the pathologies. They complain of quality, they um, complain about the added time, and there are solutions, but things are uh, all require additional resources. So I try to have this bottleneck here, which really says that the adoption of digital pathology is slow because of cost, the cost that's involved with this um, um, transformation, and also the quality. On the other hand, um, we are now seeing more improved technologies. So some of the technologies that are required for digital pathology, the costs have changed and they, there are t different technologies that allow scanning, for example, um, with different budgets. The remote work potential and the acceptance of that is truly driving the field forward. There is also increased interoperability now between the different uh, systems that institutions are interested in. And the promise of AI-based uh, tools is definitely driving the field forward. So we also anticipate um, changing reimbursement. We see more practical guidance in available publications, which I will get to in, in my next slide. The anticipated shortage of pathologists and staff is huge, and it's big, not just in anatomic pathology, it's also the technologies, the technicians, everyone with expertise in laboratory medicine. Um, there is shortage, and it's all across the nation and around the world. Um, 
we do see more adoption because of institutional digital integration. And another one is that institutions are really trying to compete with others and digital pathology is part of this new reality in which we're trying to, to migrate to better patient care. So this, is, this slide is just an effort to quickly put together some publications. Uh, there is definitely more publications out there in digital pathology or whole slide imaging on PubMed. Uh, this drop in 2024 is just because we are not uh, halfway through the year yet, but we're going to surpass 2023. So definitely lots of know-how, and it's not just academic publications, the um, vendors, the different uh, companies are also producing different um, digital pathology uh, material. They have teams that allow you to um, learn from them. So the field is really experiencing this growth in knowledge and um, know-how. Um, so I always get asked if uh, we, where are we at with the uh, innovation um, curve? And I think we can safely say that the early adopters are are there, but we are now getting into the early majority in which we are now seeing more centers, not just the academic ones. We see private office, uh, pathologist offices. We see reference laboratories, um, laboratories that are not necessarily associated with um, academic medical centers or investing in digital pathology. And then the question is, how do we start it? Because we see lots of interest. I, People contact us all the time trying to understand how do you start. And I think what is really good to think about is that digital pathology is really not any different than any other disruptive technology. Definitely, if you think about any other technology that was brought to uh, patient health care, uh, there is really no difference. The difference here is that it requires additional resources that some organizations are not equipped to, to produce easily. So if you think about how do we start a project, it's um, you have to start with a team. So somebody has the idea that it's a great idea to start looking at digital pathology because there is all the benefits that I mentioned earlier and probably others, um, but you really need to think about putting together a team um, and the team will be comprised of different stakeholders, not just from your own department, you may need additional resources of laboratorians, uh, IT administration, different voices that are going to help you really think about the potential of putting together such an initiative in your institution. And that will allow you to start putting together some documentation to, in order to get support from your leadership. And um, I try to, to um, put this here, um, and, and one of the disclaimers in this curve that I'm presenting is really, it, it, there is no right and wrong here, and some of those steps are going to happen at the same time um, from the start, which is I call T equals zero. It can be weeks or months or years for some organizations that have more bureaucracy or very risk averse or just do not have the resources that allow them to progress into, into investment in technologies. So you really have to understand the needed resources, the projected timelines before proceeding with the business plan. And the business plan, you will need to put together some sort of a document. And this document will have to get updated. Um, it will have to be presented to different audiences, not just to finance people, but also to other administration, uh, laboratories, IT. And it will constantly have to change based on where uh, the project is going to go. So once you have um, a team assembled, you have leadership support, and again, it can happen at the same time, you have to really identify and prioritize your needs. I showed some of the use cases on the first slide, and um, I, I really want to emphasize that nobody can really 
capture all those possible use cases at the same time. So every institution, every laboratory will have to identify and prioritize their needs. Either um, start with one use case, say scanning biopsies or scanning slides in the archive or scanning slides for research or find technologies that allow them to do more than um, one use case. But it's really, really hard to, to start with a big uh, effort. And it will be very dependent on the institution and their needs and their geography, et cetera. Um, so you cannot really compare a large laboratory with lots of uh, IT resources and uh, know-how with small pathology offices that are not necessarily equipped to handle um, such large uh, efforts that larger labs can do. So the next step, um, after you identify your needs, uh, you have to identify, identify the potential technologies and the specific needs. And this is really difficult when you don't know what to look for. And again, I would refer you to the literature. I would refer you to what you can get um, from talking to um, individuals, attend academic uh, professional societies meetings, um, engage with those societies, but really understand what's out there. And um, the, the technologies are there. You just have to know what you're looking for based on your use case. So I put together some things that you have to think about, and I'll mention some of them in the next slides, but you have to think about space and staff and scanners, software, servers, pretty much this ecosystem that will have to be put in place before you can progress. And this is another place where I want to, um, again, talk about how you have to engage lots of people from um, the institution besides reaching out to the vendors because you really have to get buying from lots of individuals um, in order to get this to succeed. And now you get your first scanner um, and you test it, you connect it to the network and it doesn't always work the first time. Um, it's almost never perfect the first time. And you have to start testing it in phases and uh, learn what else you missed out in your assessment. Are there more technicians that have to be uh, brought in in order to work in the laboratory? Are there more servers that need to be put in place, additional middleware, etc.? cetera? Um, and then again, depending on your use case and what you're going to be doing, you will need to do some sort of a validation before you can implement it. And if you're using slides just for archival purposes, it will be very different than if you are going to be scanning with the goal of um, offering primary diagnosis with that, um, with those images. And, and the regulatory climate is changing. Um, you must have heard about the um, FDA ruling. So uh, the, it's things that should be kept in mind and you should definitely involve your regulatory teams uh, in order to get guidance on how to do this. So I want to say finish at this point. We got a validated product. We're implementing it. But it's really it's a work in progress because there are updates. There are um, new technologies. There are new needs that will come up. So it's really not finished. This is an ongoing uh, innovation um, that you will need to sustain. You will need to constantly improve and um, at some point uh, you'll get to a point in which you may say um, it's finished but I think just like any other uh, laboratory testing um, it's there, there will be more work to develop new tools and um, new improvements so this is our um, more detailed scan um, scan operation needs again it's published um, and I put the sponsorship from leadership from that first slide uh, first. It's really crucial to have it because uh, many organizations that don't have this clear sponsorship and vision are not able to really push through and continue to, to develop tools and to really capture all the benefits of uh, those technologies, not just digital pathology, it's for every technology, but 
Um, it's, it's not a simple introduction of a small laboratory piece of equipment. You really need to do a, a larger scale um, improvement and uh, um, it will affect um, more than just the laboratory where the scanners are going to be placed. So um, here are some of the essentials and the scanner is probably the one that most individuals are worried about. Um, obviously, there are lots of uh, models out there right now. They differ in their slide uh, capacity, their throughput. Uh, what type of slides can they take? Is it continuous or batch load? Uh, can they offer Z-stacking? How fast can you and how reliable are they going to be? Um, where are they going to fit in the lab? Can you really place large instruments or do you need smaller ones? And um, different, different things that you have to think about and again, test, uh, evaluate, uh, talk to others just understand what it is that you are looking for and what, what would be the minimum requirement for you based on your needs and your um, resources. And I shouldn't forget the, uh, all the support that you will need uh, from information systems to um, um, just a way to, to operate all those different scanners, technologies, um, you will need some support from IT. You will also need some image management solutions, um, uh, integration into the laboratory information system. You will be interested in AI applications. How do you select them? Do you develop them in-house or do you uh, incorporate commercial ones? So you do need, um, uh, a team in order to support this infrastructure and to develop middleware and um, solutions as you progress in your journey. And there will be updates, there will be incompatibilities, and as I mentioned, there will be some work that will need to happen while you're on this journey. Um, there is also a need to adjust the workflows in order to allow to capture that perfect digital image because microscopy is more forgiving than the digital uh, equivalent. So the laboratory may have to change the way they prepare slides and there will be a need to do QC review for the images because once a pathologist doesn't have the slides next to them, you really want to make sure that when they receive the slide, it's the best that it can be. So just things to consider um, as you as you move through this process. And um, one of the biggest um, factors that will affect the success of your team, of your uh, work is this team that you'll put together because the digital scan team um, is really the one who's going to enable taking all this technology and move it into, into um, a viable, laboratory process and you need to train individuals to do just this new task that is really um, not something that they learned when they went to school or when they um, started working in the lab um, and the operation hours that you will want to plan for should follow those of the lab that produces them so Again, if you're a reference laboratory, you may not need to work 24 hours a day. If you're a large academic center like the one I work in, um, it's a cancer center. We operate 24 hours a day. We support our pathology operations 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, we need to think about additional IT support because the instrumentation requires constant um, um, support, not just from the external vendors, but also internally. And you really have to think about it as a um, departmental transformation. So you have to think about the needs of uh, the entire process from the specimen delivery and uh, even after the slide, get, the case gets signed out in the slide file room. So lots of training, lots of preparations some change management, etc. I mean, most innovation projects that fail, fail because there was really no, um, no um, 
um, preparation for this uh, for this transformation. Uh, one of the things that I always say should be thought of when you put together a business plan is to think about the, a hybrid workflow in which you simply start phasing out digital workflows instead of trying to go to propose going from zero to 100% digital overnight. So there's lots of benefits to doing that. Um, you really are doing what most institutions do. You can start adding scanning capacity, finding customized solutions, and then you, you really have to, it allows you to deal with the skepticism, to minimize risk, and also to align the available resources. So you can start putting together um, a business plan that has uh, phases. Um, the, the downside is that while you're doing this, you, there may be new technologies that are out there and you may end up spending more because you're doing this hybrid workflow in which you pretty much double therefore double the staffing of a purely digital uh, workflow. So these are things to, to keep in mind. And um, I think it's, uh, if you read the literature, you talk to colleagues around the world, most institutions do have some phased approach. Um, I, I was trying to capture the different scenarios. I don't think that institution um, be there, the gray uh, line that I put together in which it went from zero to 100% or close to 100% uh, in a few steps is realistic. But I also, the, the x-axis has months and years. So every institution will be really different. And some institution may choose to just focus on one uh, digital pathology use case, and you know, if if uh, just scanning uh, archival um, cases is what you're after, you may not need to to get into additional um, technologies that allow you to scan slides in real time. So, uh, one thing to remember is just not to compare yourself to the institutions um, across the across the road, I guess. Um, so everyone in the department is going to look at the cost and the needs differently. Um, and this is something that I always like to present um, because when you go into a room with people from different departments and you make your business case, uh, you will hear lots of different views. So just keep it in mind when you move forward. And um, this is also something we published. This was a result of a business plan that I put together uh, several years ago in which I realized there was, there was not much published data and I tried to put together all the different cost factors of digital pathology migration. So we have the total cost divided between the acquisition, the capital acquisition cost and the ongoing cost. And these were further divided into additional um, components. So if you think about the initial investments in scanners, uh, staff that is going to be um, tasked with be putting this together, the IT infrastructure, that's just one aspect. You will still have to think about in annual uh, budgets for the operation of this um, endeavor and for uh, maintaining, maintaining all the scanners, um, you know, the different business agree agreements uh, for maintenance and for um, dealing with downtimes. So, so there is definitely some cost that's associated with that. It's not just a one-time investment. And um, I want to point out a cost calculator that the Digital Pathology Association put together. Again, this was in response to lots of questions of individuals. How do we start? Where do we begin? And the goal here was to take that previous paper that I mentioned um, and just start breaking it down to even more categories so to allow a real-time uh, calculation of the cost and the potential revenue that's coming in. So this is something that's available on the Digital Pathology Association website. Um, it's really worth um, checking it out. And it just, took the different categories of uh, the digital pathology uh, operation and broke them down into 
even more categories and then it allowed um, the user to get real-time um, cost and rev potential revenues and um, allows it to calculate the ROI and again this was published and available for um, everyone to download. So I'm at time so I just want to do some takeaways and remind everyone as we move forward in this adoption curve uh, we are going to see more and more scanning um, opportunities, scanning technologies, uh, scanning know-how. And it, this is just the beginning of this iceberg that will allow us to, to get lots of knowledge, and lots of um, benefits to healthcare and uh, for innovation. So it's definitely of interest. I, I don't want to say that 80% of the laboratories and uh, institutions are interested are working on in the field of digital pathology but there is definitely an interest and um i i think we are definitely in the early majority adoption um just remember there will be additional resources that will be needed uh, based on your use cases and you do need to develop a business plan and to update that um so i think most of the people on this call probably understand the importance of that um, and it will be ongoing. So um, dedicated teams and also um, I always say engage with the vendors early on for any required support. Uh, they are there, they are happy to, to work with the different um, institutions. Some of them have um, teams that will come and help you set up your your planning, um, and it's really worth uh, talking to, to the vendors. And I think I'm at time, so we can open it up for questions. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Arden, uh, not just for the, the presentation, but all of the uh, countless hours of hard work that I know have gone into the research and the papers that, that have uh, come out of this. We've actually got some questions coming through to us. Um, First one, uh, Richard asked, have you seen any changes in whole slide digital, digital scanners technology? Uh, definitely. Um, yes, I can probably talk about it for a few hours now, but um, um, yes. And um, it's not just the number of models that are being offered, but it's also the software and their capabilities. So digital pathology 2024 is very different than digital pathology 2020 or even 2023. So there are, and we, we see a lot of excitement on the vendor side once, we, once they see the potential of the market and the investments that can be made in their technology. So definitely. Thanks. And uh, we have another question. Mark asks, can you speak to any potential updates on Re CPT reimbursements for digital pathology? Uh, um, we are all waiting. So um, if for those of you who don't know, there are those CPT codes, uh, the T codes that um, are really, they're not for reimbursement yet, but they're trying to capture the data that's being um, the usage of the uh, potential CPT codes that are associated with digital pathology. So we don't have any news as far as I know. The, there are task forces. There are lots of individuals who are involved with that. I do not know of any changes that are coming in in 2025 for sure. I really don't know if that's going to happen. But you know, we want to expand the use of digital pathology everywhere, and this will really drive the the willingness to to get reimbursement specifically for digital right specifically for digital exactly yeah because yeah, the, um, the advantages still uh, exist for the tests themselves which are often included yes, definitely and you know one of the things that we tried to calculate was how much uh what is the anticipated uh revenue for for those cpt codes but it's really it's really hard to get and we need data and we need data for multiple institutions in order to get that. Great. We, we do have another one. George asks, do you have any recommendations for helping laboratory management adopt 
new digital technology. I'm interested in talking to my management team about adopting digital pathology. Um, it's it's a tough one. Um, you you do need data. You need to show you know start with just looking at the literature, or looking at what's out there, and and do a presentation um, talking about the benefits and the future. I've been in meetings like that from I don't know many many years, and uh, it's sometimes really hard because people don't understand the technology and the potential benefits. So. I think now, because there is so much know-how and publications, it, it's easier to get buy-in from institutions. Um, you can always say that everyone else is doing it, which is almost true. Mm -hmm. um, it, it looks like Mark asks, do you believe that the adoption of AI-assisted diagnostics tools is an inevitability in digital pathology? Um, I think inevitability sounds negative. I think it's very exciting. I, I think, yes, um, once you have the data that shows that it improves patient care, I think the, the data will show that it makes sense to invest in it. And I think we are going to see more and more of that. Um, from what some of us have seen, um, there is some definitely interesting uh, technologies out there that are really improving the diagnosis, the accuracy, and help the pathologists when they do the work. And then there are all, all those benefits for research and uh, discoveries that you cannot do without digital images. So yes, it's definitely ongoing. Yeah, I could also speak to that for hours, but I'm not quite unbiased in that. <laughs> James asks, uh, let, let's maybe do one more. Uh, James asked, from your experience, what are the main barriers to clinical adoption of digital pathology and how can they be overcome? So barriers, I think. one of the biggest barriers is I don't want to call it change management, but you're really changing the way a pathologist is working. So what we are doing, um, instead of just digitizing and not allowing the pathologist to look at the glass slide, we are doing uh, this hybrid workflow in which you are sending the glass slides to the pathologist so they can choose to um, view the glass slide, the digital image, or both of them. And I think for many pathologists, it just makes them comfortable knowing that the digital slide is there, but also the glass slide in case they need it. This is one barrier that I think some institutions are just not able to, to, to go through because, um, you know, you're, you're increasing your cost because you're doing both uh, workflows, but you're really doing this slow adoption and the other big one is the need to validate and um, you do need to have individuals who will be able to come into the laboratory and do a validation and some pathology laboratories are just not don't have the know-how and the experience to to validate uh, laboratory testing that's true well thank you very much uh, there were a few more questions but uh, we will reach out to you after the webinar I'd like to thank all of our participants today in the webinar, especially Dr. Arden, uh, for your wonderful presentation. We will be sending a copy of this recording out to all of you attendees uh, so you can uh, review it at your leisure afterwards. And so without further ado, I would like to thank all of you and bid you a great afternoon. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye.